Um, well, um, let's just jump right into this. Um, we're going to uh, continue um, from last week, uh, part seven, and today the title of uh, the message is Start With Why. And so before I begin, I do want to share with you, I felt that there was a, a disagreement in the spirit last week. And if you want to know why it is that it's taken me two weeks uh, to preach this particular message, is because I had two leaders who were praying against me during the service. They were Josh and Donovan, so I'm going to blame them because they said, Pastor Will's got five points, and there's no way he's making it through five points. And so uh, I felt that there was tension in the spirit, and I guess uh, they won, you know, and so uh, that's why I'm going with uh, two today. No, I, we just... This is a very important subject um, in any period of time, and I'm thankful that the teenagers returned and returned in full for force here um, in the first row, and so um, I pray that they're taking really good notes. Um, I pray that they understand how important this is, and, and more importantly, even to those who are here this day who are uh, single, and when I say single, unmarried, I'm not talking about boyfriend, girlfriend. Okay, I'm talking about unmarried folks. And I believe that uh, the remaining principles that we'll talk about today, I believe, just allow for us to have a, a good pathway um, in which to follow biblical truth so that we are honoring God um, in every phase of our lives. Amen? Let us pray. Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity that you have given today to preach the word of God. And I would ask, O oh Lord, that your spirit would sanctify us. And I ask, O oh Lord, that your word, God, would shape us and mold us so that everything that we do is in accordance to your will. Father, we thank you. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to start first with the two principles that we had began with last week. Uh, number one, that we are to be submitted to Jesus Christ. And that number two, that we are to be accountable to your wise counsel. And we talked about the wise counsel in regards to those in whom are in the authoritative uh, positions in your life, those who are qualified um, to have the type of conversations that lead us back to a place in which we understand that our decisions affect the entire community around us. And so I want to start with uh, number three today. Be honest about your hidden cause. Be honest about your hidden cause when it comes down to biblical dating. Essentially, the same question that you were posed during our time of connecting with one another. Start with why. Start with why. If we're being honest about starting with our why, I think it would help us not to waste a lot of time in relationships. Amen? If we just started with why. I love what Taylor shared this morning in being honest about the way that she felt. Can we be honest and start with why? Are you lonely? If I'm a teenager, is it just the popular thing to do? Everybody's booing up, so it becomes a popular thing to do. Is it just because I want to sleep with somebody and have sex? Is it that? Is it because of status? I, mean, I grew up in a culture of pleasure. And in that culture of pleasure that was dominated by men, it was about the notches on your belt. It was about how many women you could sleep with. Start with your why. For some of you, you're broke. And so you're dating because the other person has money. But you don't want to let them know. So you'll do anything to remain patient so that one day they'll share a little bit of that money with you. I'm just being honest. Some of us are just envious. 
You see things happening with someone else, and instead of being happy for them, instead of celebrating it, you envy. And you envy to the point where it creates this division with you and others, and you become bitter. Or is it because you're insecure? Is it because you feel you lack love? Or are you trying to prove something? And if so, what are you trying to prove? Or is it just because that person looks good? Is it just because of their outward appearance? Now, don't get me wrong. Appearance matters now. But appearance ain't everything. I'm going to step over here for a moment, okay? And then I'm going to get right back into where I'm going because I want to stay on this word appearance. Me and my daughter like to play a game. And this game that we play is typically in the parking lots of grocery stores and the parking lots of restaurants. And she knows exactly what I'm getting ready to say. And the game is appropriate, inappropriate. That's the game we play. I got really creative ways to cultivate godliness in my house. Because my goal with my daughter is to teach her how to think, not what to think. So that it's not just because my daddy told me so. Just because the Bible said so. But to learn how to integrate the word of God into real life situations. So we see people walking by with power and glory hanging out. And with power and glory hanging out, I look to my daughter and I just say, hey, appropriate, inappropriate. Because I want to know the lens in which she's looking at life. And there was one particular individual that we had to bring in somebody else because we were in a conflict with one another. My wife usually has to break that tie. And my wife doesn't always side with me. But as she's looking, she's telling me why. And what I talk about is how it is that you appear and how it is that you dress. That's what you're trying to attract. And parents, we've done a horrible job. It starts with us. Of allowing our children to walk out of the house with whorish decor. And we talk about it, but what are we doing about it? And so what happens is that we appear in a way that does not invoke the testimony of God. Because the question I'm really asking my daughter is, as this person is dressing in this particular way, did they start with their why? Because you know exactly why you put the clothes on that you have on. You know exactly why. This isn't some sermon to say women should dress like this and men should dress like that because men were just as bad. But what I am saying is that we must start with why with everything. With everything. Because if we are to be the bearers of the image of God. And if we are royal representatives, then I pray that our intentions are to, in public, to be ambassadors of the king because we are royal representatives. Be honest about your hidden cause. Be honest about your feelings. Be honest about your direction. Be honest about your intentions. I've got a little slogan that I use that tension needs attention. So if I'm feeling a certain way, am I feeling a certain way about somebody, whether good or bad, it needs attention. And within that attention, I need to start with why. 
Why do I feel this way when this person comes around? Why am I attracted to this person in this particular way? We have to start with why. You, knew, you know who knew his why? Jesus. If you go back to Mark chapter 1, for those who are taking notes, in verses 38 through 39, we're very familiar with this particular account and starting with why. It was a situation in which Jesus had traveled to Capernaum with Peter, and it was Peter's mother-in-law who had gotten sick, and Jesus healed. And so that day, the Bible says that everyone in the town came to Jesus, and he began to heal them. Well, it says the next day, he got up early while everyone was asleep, went to a desolate area, and began to pray. The Bible says that the disciples and others were looking for Jesus. He says, where have you been? There are people waiting on you. See, they had their why. We want you to stay here. We want you to be with us. But Jesus stated his why. He says, and he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Jesus understood his why, and he stood on it and would not allow for the outward pressures of life and people to begin to pollute his missional cause. Everybody seeing that? Let's turn to Psalm 139, verse 23, 24. Because today I'm going to make it through three points, Donovan. I know this isn't a competitive church, but you know what? After the sermon, he's like, you ain't getting through five points. And I was like, you're right. I wasn't going to get through five points. <laughs> Psalm 139, verse 23 through 24. Start with why. The psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. This is language of invitation into those private moments of your intentions. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, that word grievous, that grievous way, is in a sense speaking about idolatrous mindsets. Those things in which we set above the God that we serve. So typically when you see this word being used in a grievous way within the Old Testament, you see it in conjunction with idol worship. That's why we must start with why. Because we love to take things and turn it into God. And we exalt those things without inviting God to search our hearts to see if there be anything grievous within me that is setting itself up against the authority of God. It's important. I can remember, and I've shared this story, but I don't know if I've shared underneath this story. Um, for most of you um, who have been here for the last you know, 10 years, um, you know that uh, I turned down um, an NFL coaching opportunity. I was not going to be starting at the lower levels. Um, I was going to be inserted right on in and with a playoff team. And I said, no. Nobody in my council agreed with me. Not one person. My pastor at that time, he was just like, Will, you would impact so many individuals in the NFL. I had a lot of my players that I coached, and they were just like, you're missing out on an opportunity of a lifetime. And I said, well, the fact that they're actually contacting me validates what I'm doing. I said, that's number one. But I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I said, I never dreamt one day of ever coaching in the NFL. I dreamt of playing in the NFL. I said, the only reason at the end of the day that I would desire to coach in the NFL would be for my own pride. To literally to say now, hey, I coached in the NFL and to change the way that you think about me, but you would have never known. 
I would have known that. And God knew that. That's why right after my interview, when I got on the plane, it was the loudest no I've ever heard in my life from God. The loudest no I've ever heard in my life. In no teens, it was not no. It wasn't that. It wasn't Darth Vader-like, okay? It wasn't that, all right? We got to be very careful when we tell people we heard from God, because that's what people be thinking. William, this is no. (laughs) It wasn't that. But you know what it was? It's because when you're spending time with God, oh, oh, I'm sorry, when you're spending time in the Word of God, and the Word of God is searching your heart every day, sanctifying you, because that's His will, that we would be shaped and molded by His why, then when you put it up against your why, it don't match. So that's what happened. It didn't match. Now, I can go against the authority of the Word of God and His revealed will, or I can try to push through and make something happen that God never inspired, that He never inspired. Start with why. See, God's Word become the glasses by which we put on to see the world. It's what we call a biblical worldview. You put on these glasses, and these glasses, the Word of God becomes the filter by which you see your pursuit for companionship, not the other way around. Folks, you know what happens when it's the other way around, when it's now my feelings and my desires and my why, and then we have the Bible as the backdrop. Then what's going to happen is that you are going to twist so many scriptures your way. It's warped because it's going through your lens. We're fallen creatures. It's warped. So then all of a sudden it gets to the word of God and now you're justifying based upon your own desires. And then we call it the Holy Spirit. No. When the word of God is front and center, then the word of God begins to show you what this world is really about and it begins to show you why it is that you're pursuing the person that you are pursuing. You need to start with why. If you're talking about really, and we talked about the danger of relationships last week, correct? That if you're really thinking about this, that means that every phase of what I call and what we call biblical dating, that means that every phase you have to have a why. Every phase. So, at the beginning phase of attraction, first of all, and it's unfortunate I have to say this nowadays, is your attraction to the opposite sex. Let's start there. So it goes from attraction and what you're feeling about somebody. And this is the part, see, you involve your counsel at the very beginning. When you start feeling something. Okay? That's that Kansas thing, you feeling something. But then you go to that next stage, you're exploring. Okay, pause. I didn't say dating. You're exploring. I'm just, get a cup of coffee with you. Want to know what you're about. And I would recommend that that cup of coffee is not by yourself, but with someone. Why? Because you don't know them. You could be going home in a trunk. Y'all watch, y'all watch the same shows I watch. People going home in trunks. My girl, she told me that she went out with this guy. You remember Ed from last week? All right. You don't went out with Ed. But you know what? Hey, we going to the Starbucks, so we cool. And so he just asked me to get in, get in his car, all right, just for a moment because he wanted to talk in private. And now you understand, I'm saying this while I'm talking to a reporter. That was the last time that I seen such and such the last time I heard from them. At least two, y'all scrapping. (laughs) Get off of me. Pastor told me about you. (laughs) Right? But it's exploration with your community. Why? Because you already are blinded because you feel a certain way towards them. It's the same reason why Pastor Will can't just make decisions on his own in certain aspects of ministry because I may feel a certain way towards somebody. 
And if I feel a certain way towards somebody, let's say I like them and I just say, yeah, I'm going to bring them in and they're going to do this and that. It's got to go through the elders. Why? Because I may be bringing someone in and it may be nepotism. It may just be because I've got some history with them and then I start trying to justify. But we have to go through the community of leaders that have their nose Their eyes, their hands, their feet in the word of God to say, we don't think this is wise. Right from the point of attraction. So you have this expiration phase. And then, all right, and you could challenge me later on this. I believe there's only three phases. After that, you playing around. Attraction, exploration, commitment. Commitment to what? Not boyfriend, girlfriend. Commitment to what? Marriage. I don't play. My life is important. It's amazing. It is amazing. See, this is when my daughter gets up. She's like, oh, he's getting ready to start with this, you know. She's like, she hears it every day. She's like, it's my time to get up. Okay. Y'all saw that. Hold her accountable. But this will stop us from playing games. This will stop wasting a whole lot of time. But when I say I think it's amazing, I think that it's amazing that we are (laughs) more apt to commit to individuals who do not commit to God and who do not commit to us. It's amazing to me that you will spend a short amount of time simply because your attraction is pulling you in a certain way and you're committed to an individual who has no desire to be committed to you. They have a desire to commit it to what you do for them. That's a big difference. Big difference. When we get to commitment, it lets you know I'm serious. I am to be honored. As a man or a woman, I'm to be honored. I don't want to play around. And if you're not ready for commitment, we ain't ready. We're going to stay in this exploration phase. And I'm not staying in this phase to try to bend your arm to commit to me. Start with why. Is there a commitment to marriage? Now, When I say commitment to marriage, that means from the moment that you get engaged, it's not I'm still thinking about it. See, when you were betrothed to someone, it was like marriage that you have. It's essentially not just a promise, but I have committed my life from this day forward to marry. We're just getting things in order. That's it. It is not a commitment to another commitment to maybe think about it. Roll with me now. Like I said, you may disagree. I'm going against a lot of tradition right now. This is why I'm against the term boyfriend, girlfriend, because it isn't in the Bible. Because God, he recognizes the relationship between a husband and a wife. That's what he recognizes. Boyfriend and girlfriend can be some very skittish terms that you're utilizing because you're scared of commitment. Then don't get involved. Because it's serious. Let's move on. Because Donovan, I I feel like Donovan's going to be like, see, this is how you go. When you start with why, it's like what it says in Matthew 6.33. Let me break it down very simple. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all else will be given unto you. That means I got you. You'll be all right. Just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means the rulership of God upon your heart. And the fruit of that is in your ability to wait on God. That's the fruit of it. Be shaped by his will, his affections. Number four. Be responsible with your spiritual communion. All right. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Now, many of us have been taught through this passage as if this passage 
is dealing primarily with marriage, and it is not. Let me give you disclaimer, okay? When we start talking about unequally yoked, this entire chapter has nothing to do with marriage. But there are some deep-seated principles that help us to understand what the Apostle Paul was getting at so that we can apply it in a lot of different situations. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to read here from the screen. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That means do not be mismatched. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Pay attention to the language that this is all spiritual. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Temple as a people, not temple just as a person. For we are the temple of the living God, we plural church. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord all mighty. Even in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, when the Apostle Paul speaks about remarriage, he talks about remarriage in this particular aspect. He says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, okay, let me pause right there, okay? So for anybody who believes there's only one person created for you, you are wrong. The reason why we can say this is remarriage is all through the Bible. So if you like the one, there's ones, but you can't be married to all of them <laughs> at once. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get right back in. I'm sorry. That's Will Sullivan's commentary. That's what my commentary would sound like. Okay. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. But Lord, are these last four words only in the Lord. That's huge. That means there is no compromise in the fellowship. None. Not at all. That means that even in this part of attraction exploration, stop asking where they work. Stop asking all that. Sometimes we, we engage the practical before we engage the biblical. We see through the lens of Scripture, start there. Don't start with the fruit, start with the root. What do I mean by that? Sit down with them. Who do you worship? Right, let's start there. Not like, hey, how are you doing? Who do you worship? We're not here. Hey, relationships are dangerous. All right? You, you guys understand? We, they're dangerous. Okay, stop playing around, all right, with your water gun. Who do you worship? Ladies and gentlemen, okay? <laughs> when we interview people that are coming to this church to be leaders in particular departments, where do you think we start? How good you play? How many people you've played in front of? Hey, who do you worship? Tell us your testimony. Right? We don't want to, we want to get to that last. You better get to that first. Because whom he worships is going, to is going to indicate how he serves and who he's serving. If somebody wishy-washy, yeah, the date's over. If that's what you want to call it. You guys think I'm playing? Look here. When I was looking for a house, we had particular standards, okay? My wife hated when I did this. As soon as we would walk in with the realtor, I'd walk in and I'm like, time to go. And she would be like, I took off work. I did this and that. And then the realtor, you know, he's my friend. You know, he looked at me like, what's up? It doesn't fit. It's wasting my time. I said, I'm just like anybody else. I'll start getting caught up with all of this. Like, man, this is awesome. And then begin to change my standards to fit my wants. 
Who do you worship? Who is your God? Are you even saved? You need to look in the mirror and ask yourself, are you saved? (laughs) Start there. We don't pursue companionship to save people. Where in the Bible does it say, I need you to marry them so you can convert them? We don't turn their spiritual lights on. You don't have access to that. Jesus does. Our job is to please God. We're not, we're not conversion artists. We don't walk in like I'm going to change you. How dare we? That's why we're arrogant as Christians. Oh, I'm going to change you because, you know, we start quoting truth. Power of God and this, that, and the other. <laughs> Look, think about this. This is crucial. King Solomon. Read it in 1 Kings 11. Teenagers, you better write this down. The wisest person that ever lived on this earth. He got yoked to unbelievers. And you know what happens? One influences the other. He was the wisest person that ever lived, and he was influenced. And it turned his heart away from God because what? Syncretism. It's not that he abandoned God wholeheartedly. He abandoned God partially. And he began to adopt the views of other gods and began to worship, began to put up different altars. Do you see how crazy this is? He's the king. My goodness. Now, some of you may read and say, okay, 700 wives, 300 concubines. But a lot of that was political advantages because those were 300 princesses. So it served a political advantage for him. Not that he was just some lust town because he was wise. He lusted after the ones that would grant him power. But the Bible says it turned his heart away from God. Woo! That means sexual temptation is strong. Strong. And so we get into these situations of being yoked and mismatched because what's happening is that now when you get in a situation where you're like, oh, I can change them. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm strong. I stand firm in the faith. I can change them. You know, because some of y'all, look, I'm going to be honest with you. If you know my wife, some of y'all are living in Patty's dreams. And this is what I mean. I was a heathen. And so some women start looking like, well, Will was a heathen. Look how he turned out. I'm being honest. There's not one person in her council. We talked about this at lunch. You know, I was telling Tiffany, I was like, there's not one person in her council who said, Will's a great guy. They said, run, girl, run. You guys think I'm playing? I was in class with all of them. They were like, get with, no, she's a good girl. Will, no. But like a dog, I sniff. I found her. I, I ain't a good guy. That's what I told you. I ain't a good guy. I'm a dog. Now you got to understand, Patty believed in God, but Patty wasn't following God. So you got two heathens. A little different. We're not talking about somebody who was just walking in the glory of God. I'm throwing my wife out there. She was not walking in the glory of God. She was walking in that same darkness that I was walking in. You get two people in darkness that are blind, that's what happens. But what am I saying? God does not decree. He does not decree interfaith companionship. I didn't say interracial. And that's where a lot of people get this mixed up. When the God, the Old Testament, begin to share about this intermingling, it had to do with their worship. Not their skin color. And he was, come on, we're sheep. We're sheep. We're, we easily wander. What am I saying? What I'm saying is choose harmony over companionship. Harmony. Unity with the Spirit of God over companionship. Okay, let me break this down even some more. See, when I say com- companionship, I'm really talking about compatibility. And when I say compatibility, I'm talking about individuals that you're able to get along with without conflict. 
Like, man, this person, you hear it all the time, they make me happy because we don't argue. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not how you base whether a relationship is going to go great. <sighs> Let me tell you why. Let me give you from a man's perspective. We are patient because we have in our minds something that we want. So you think we're going to create arguments and create issues that are going to hinder our ability to get what we want? Ah, hey, let me tell you this. I don't share anything public that my wife doesn't already know, but hey, I used to write my wife poems. All right? I wasn't no rapper, all right, like Kev. I wrote good poems. I can write really well. You know, and I was just serenading her. And in serenading her, it was like, man, this guy's a nice guy. Why? Because I don't want drama. She wasn't looking at the harmony, my unity with the Spirit of God. Now, I know she's back there. She's probably going to bang on the wall. She's back there with Luke, and she's like, you're going too far now because you was part of this. But when we're looking at unity with the Spirit, what we're saying is that there should be fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Quit asking if individuals are saved. Stop that. We will lie. Men and women will lie. Yeah, I'm saved. You know how many boyfriends and girlfriends have ran through this church? Worshipped, right? Man, you know I'm trying to get my life right until they, they get some. And then you don't see them no more. And that's what happens. Because it's like, well, he said or she said they were saved. Where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? John 15, 8 says this, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. See, what happens is when you're unequally yoked in this situation, what starts to happen is that we no longer are under one purpose to glorify God. Because we're playing, I hate to say it this way, we're playing two entirely different games. So that's like if you play, you play volleyball, correct? Okay, you play volleyball. Let's say that you showed up and someone came to the volleyball court with a golf club. And then they tell you, like, hey, we're going to play. The first question you have to ask is what? What game are we playing? Because the game is going to dictate the rules. And who is making the rules? One has to overcome the other. There is no blendedness when it comes down to worship. Care more about worship than happiness. If you care more about worship than happiness, if you do that, there will be joy. Joy that flows from the strength of the Lord in helping us in these situations so that we can wait, so that we can see, and we are with someone long enough to see their faith tested. So if you're asking me, well, how long, Pastor Will? Long enough to see their faith tested. And if you want to know where I get that principle, well, when it comes down to overseers, individuals who are leaders in the church, it says there what? That there must be a time of testing. In a time of testing, in the conflict, you're going to see what's inside of them is going to come out. What's inside of them is going to come out. Not their church attendance, not them raising their hands in worship, not because they attended a Bible study with you and all that. You're going to see during testing what comes out. And what comes out, it should be the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, faith, like all of that. You should see that. If you ain't seeing it, then you probably yoked with somebody that's mismatched, and they're not worshiping the same God that you are. You need to ask them questions. Ask them about the way they view the scriptures. You may find out when they view the scriptures, ah, well, man made it. It's not inspired. We have a problem. 
You need to ask them, who is Jesus to you? A good moral teacher. He ain't Lord. Nah, good moral teacher, though. These are the type of questions that you need to ask. Why? Because people can fool us. So you can go through all these principles. People still get through and they fool us. Be content in him. Be responsible with your spiritual communion. Do not allow for intimacy to trump inspiration. Last one, Donovan and Josh. Be honorable with your relational cover. Be honorable. And I don't think this gets talked about enough. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, no matter what phase that you're in, whether I'm in a phase of attraction, exploration, or commitment, I am seeking the greatest good for the other person. All right, now we're getting ready to go into some waters now. No matter what, that doesn't change whether you are attracted to someone or not. That principle does not change. That truth does not change. We seek the greatest good for others. This provides an opportunity for others to see Jesus Christ and his power working through you and how you love others by honoring them and respecting them. Hold on now. Even when they don't respect themselves. It's a relational cover. We're talking about honor versus shame tactics. It's a fruit of the spirit, self-control, love. It's what we read about in Ruth chapter 3. You want to talk about some God-honoring principles? I could have did a whole sermon on Ruth chapter 3. But when you look at it, and if you're familiar with the story, and you know that Ruth comes down, she's taking this chance after being widowed, and Naomi done hyped her up. Go get your man. All right, now pause. So for those who have a view that only a man can pursue a woman, I would challenge that. I, I would say in the Bible what we see is primarily in what is normative and what should be is a man having the guts to walk across the room. Now, with my wife, because I know you're going to ask, I didn't because I was in all kinds of drama. And I couldn't walk across the room because of the drama. But she saw me. I blinked. I did whatever I could to get her to walk across the room. <laughs> True story. But... You have a situation here where Ruth pursued her husband. So Boaz then had a little bit to drink. He was there at the threshing floor. It's dark. There's no lights out. Naomi shares something that was customary at that time. So don't be, <laughs> don't be walking in somebody's room all right, and getting up under the covers right there by their feet and saying, marry me. Like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. That's weird, okay? But we're talking about something customary that meant something more than what we value today. And here she is by faith. They have a conversation. He begins to share that, yes, he is a redeemer, but there is one before him. But here's the honoring part. He loved God so much. Remember, love God, love others. 
that he chose to cover her, not sleep with her. And then in the morning time, so that her reputation would remain upheld. Because if you see somebody, it's, it's the walk of shame. You know, it's like, oh, I know what you went down to the threshing floor to do. He guarded her reputation and guarded his reputation. He says, we got to be careful now. There was integrity. There was honor because he loved God first. And he covered her. And the Bible says, like, he was metaphorically like the Lord's wings. See, that's foreign to us now. See, when you're in a situation where you are pursuing companionship, do you think like that? If I really love God, then I honor that person and I don't shame them. I don't shame them by sleeping with them before marriage. I don't shame them. Even if your friends gave you a high five or they were like, hey, how good was it? You don't shame them because it matters to God. Nowadays, especially with the young people, you know what they'll do? You'll get somebody texting you saying, you know what, share a part of your body with me. Take your clothes off. Snap a shot. Because someone, the enemy, has a demonic agenda to shame you. The internet is unforgiving. The internet will never forgive you. And you think it's just because between you and that person, anything hidden in that manner is already wrong. This world looks to shame you, not honor you. Oh, well, what does this mean? That means not sleeping with someone before marriage is the highest honor. The highest honor. I love you so much, God, that I am willing to honor those in whom you have placed around me and cover them because of my decision not to cross that boundary and to take from them something that they'll never get back. So you may ask, well, why? Because we want to honor them. Honor. It's God honoring. Why? Because if you're doing it, you're sinning against God. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, hey, it's, you'd rather marry than burn with passion. Essentially, you'd rather be in a situation where you're honoring God as opposed to sinning against God. Well, hold on now. That means even the way you go about this, this thing called biblical dating, this dating and breaking up with multiple people. You are cultivating habits of divorce. Multiple people, multiple breakups, you're cultivating divorce. So that by the time you get married, you're walking in with an exit clause because you've been trained to do it. It destroys your witness. Oh, but I'm not going to leave this out. Because if we're talking about honoring people and honoring God, then let's be here. Cohabitation is not loving your neighbor. Living with someone before you are married is not God honoring. It is imitating and mocking the institution of marriage. It's mocking it. It's what some of the older saints say, playing house playing house. Well, can I give you a different outlook on this? Okay. I come into the house, usually around five, six o'clock, and I've been trying at times this intermittent fasting. Okay. It means at a certain time, I just stop eating and whatever. But when a house smells good, 
It's a heck of a temptation. So what I do is I, you know, my wife's got things out and she asks me, she says, are you hungry? And what I'll say is I don't want dinner. She's like, no, but are you hungry? No, no, I'm sticking to my fast. But then you see what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm like walking around the kitchen because I, I got that smell. And what I start doing is I start picking at the ingredients. Anybody else like me? You know, especially like if Steve cooking too. If Steve cooking, like if I'm over there at the Williams house, I'm, I'm looking to see what you got. Because you know Steve. Steve will sit there and start letting up the aluminum foil. Like, you see this, Pastor? I've been out here all day with this. Okay? Am I telling you? Hey, am I lying? No, it's like, no. <laughs> so you start smelling. So you start taking bits and pieces. You keep putting it in your mouth because it tastes good. That's what you want. But you won't commit to the dinner. But I like the elements of the dinner. I like the ingredients of the dinner, but I won't commit to a full meal. That's cohabitation. Because by your cohabitating ways, what you're saying is that I love the look of marriage. But I'm not willing to commit to marriage. I'm willing to commit to the ingredients of it. You don't want the full meal. But what if you're already in this situation right now? My challenge to you is by faith, honor God. Let me give you a little bit of backstory with me. I didn't have much money, but I wanted to honor God. I thank God for a friend of mine who was dropping me off one day When I told him I was going to propose to Patty, bring her up here, I had an apartment downtown. And he looked at me, he was like, so where's she going to be staying, champ? I was like, with me, champ. And he was just like, well, Will. He was like, what about the temptation? I was like, I'm good. I'm better than Solomon, you know. I'm good. He said, nah, man. He says, this is going to destroy the witness. This is going to destroy your testimony. You have to walk out of your house every day to justify. Maybe it's because, hey, you know, we, we're already engaged, so it's almost like we're married. So let's go ahead and combine our resources, you know, because I'm getting ready to get out of my lease, and you're getting ready to get out of Like, we start, I told you, this better be here as the filter. So in that moment, I prayed. And I said, God, I want to honor you. I don't have much money. I can barely pay my rent. I went to church that night. We had a Bible study. There was a man that I worked out with. His name was Leonard Davis. Give him his flowers now. He was the second pick in the NFL draft behind Michael Vick. He was at, he was at church that day. Trent, you know. <laughs> so what ends up happening is I'm explaining to the pastor my situation because now I want to honor God. But it's a bitter, you know, like, oh, you know, I got to honor God. So now I got to figure out something with me and Patty. He overheard. And he says, you can stay with me. I said, for real, we barely knew each other. And he stayed in Queen Creek. So I made the decision that before I left to go propose to my wife, I gave her that apartment and my car. I'll get around on a bus, but we're going to honor God. We have the opportunity. We weren't there the whole time, but we're held accountable to what we know. And I said, I want to honor God. So I stayed in Queen Creek and had an apartment over here. And you know what God did? When I went down to propose to her, her parents said, hey, why don't you just get married like the next day? Cool. Ended up getting married. Didn't even have to use it. (laughs) So I want you walking out of here like, (laughs) but all right. But I want you to see something. Being God honoring pleased God who made a way when there was no way. Care about Jimmy getting up? (laughs) All I'm saying is this. Consider the heart of others. Just know that when you're out with someone... Just know that someone could be out with your future somebody. And you want to make sure that you are God honoring in these moments and not to break their hearts. 
and inflict pain upon their soul. But man, they walk away, even if it don't work out, like that man honored me. That woman honored me. Because you know what happens? They begin to see the holiness of God. They begin to see why it is that God said we must be set apart. They begin to see that we serve the almighty. We begin to see that, yes, we're in the world, but we're just not of it. They begin to see the grace of God working through you because you know the love in which he poured out on Calvary. You know that he's called you to be obedient while you're working out your obedience through love and faith in him, knowing that he is a rewarder of those in whom pursue him and believe that he exists. We serve a God who is waiting to bless you. If we're willing to take the courageous step and believe him at his word and to know that there is a way to pursue companionship so that I am God honoring and I don't put myself out there to the cultural pleasures of the world, but I am seeking and maintaining and preserving integrity and this public reputation that God may be served by the way that I serve others. It's holiness. Be more inclined to assist someone in that as opposed to injuring them. Biblical dating. That's just five principles an approach that'll save your life. It will preserve marriage. And honor God and allow for this next generation of individuals to have hope. To have hope. And to understand how important this is. Let us pray. Uh, Father, I just... Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. I, my God, I wish someone would have said this to me long, long, long time ago. Uh, Lord, um, as you have placed, Lord, within us um, a desire, Lord, for uh, companionship, I pray that we go back to what's been learned. Father, that gift isn't necessarily for everyone. Some will remain unmarried and some will marry. But no matter what, I pray, Father, that as a body, that, Father, we continue to come together and to honor one another, to rejoice when others rejoice, to weep when others weep. And Father, relationships are, are difficult, Lord. And I pray, God, that throughout these difficulties, I pray, Father, you grant us wisdom from above. Help us to understand that, Lord, there is a spirit dwelling within us that's calling for us to be separate from the world, but yet calling us, Lord, to a deeper, more intimate life with you. I pray, Father, for those in whom right now are unequally yoked and don't know what to do. I pray, God, that they would search the scriptures, Lord, that they would cry out to you, O oh Lord, and that, Father, you would answer them and give them wisdom. I pray for those, Lord, who are in a relationship right now where maybe they've been married and one spouse is saved and the other isn't. I pray, God, that they will continue to serve that unbelieving spouse, oh God, to the glory of God. And that, Father, no matter how long it takes, 10, 15, 20 years, I pray that they would remember, God, that their salvation, Lord, is not dependent upon, oh Lord, them, but, Lord, it's your spirit that would open up their eyes, regenerate their hearts, oh God, and bring dead men to life. Father, I would ask, O oh Lord, at this day that anyone who does not have a relationship with you, that, Father, this day, Lord, they would cry out to you, Lord, while you still will be found, and that, God, they would pour their hearts out and just say to you, O oh God, I repent. I repent. I know you are real. Father, bring your spirit upon me. Fill me, O oh Lord, with the Holy Ghost and help me to live a life that you bought and paid for. Father, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If we could rise to our feet. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To stream more of our past video sermons, please check out our YouTube channel or our website at endurancechurch.com. 
You can also learn more about our church, our various ministries, and how you can get involved. Again, our website is endurancechurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line anytime at info at endurancechurch.com. God bless you, and thanks for being part of our online service today.